uh, I've started recording it, and yes, it is recording. Okay, so any other questions? Okay, uh, I would just like to make a small remark about homework assignments. Okay, my policy on homework assignments is slightly different from uh, normal policies on homework assignments. Okay, uh, I don't know if you've read my policy on homework assignment. My idea is that homework assignments are part of your learning process. Okay, that is, you you listen to the videos, right? You you understand the course material. Then, in order to reinforce that understanding, you go and complete the homework assignments. Okay, so it's fine if you make mistakes on your homeworks because you're still learning. And as you do the homework, your concepts get strengthened. Okay. So I fully expect that you will make mistakes when you do your homeworks, okay? And you need not worry about losing points if you make mistakes on your homework assignments, okay? So even if you make mistakes, let's say uh, you score only 60% on some of the homeworks, 70% on other homeworks, at the end of the semester, you can, get, get, uh, you can still score the complete 100% for assignments, okay? Assignments are worth 10% of the grade, even if you make mistakes, at the end of the semester, you can still get 10 on 10 for assignments. Okay, that's the way I look at assignments. I'm looking at it as something to help you to, uh, to master the subject matter. Okay, so don't worry about making mistakes on assignments. Okay, all I want you to do is to submit assignments on time. That's all I want. Okay, now it's just that I want you to do them because it's part of your learning process. If you don't do the assignments, you're not going to be in good shape with respect to the tests and in terms of understanding the material, that's all. Okay, now if you submit, uh, you know, random answers to the assignments, honestly, there's nothing I can do about it. Okay, this is the real truth. Because I have more than 115 students in the class. There's really no way in hell I'm going to be able to go and check everything and see if all your answers are meaningful. OK, so some amount of grading I can do, but, you know, I really cannot. So this is for your benefit. OK, you use it as best as you can. OK, so the main point is I want to make the assignments, uh, you know, low stakes. I want you to be able to freely go and work on the assignment without worrying about anything about, oh, what if I make a mistake? My grade is going to suffer. Nothing like that. OK. So any questions about the assignments? Okay, uh, and just another point, a minor point, which is uh, obviously, you know, this is a hybrid class. We are not going to be meeting many times during the semester, okay, which is both a benefit and a problem. It's a benefit in the sense that it gives you a lot of flexibility. It can be a problem in the sense that you don't get to see the instructor enough and you have questions and all that, okay? So that is the reason, of course, that we have teams, okay? And uh, I want you to use teams to the fullest to teach out to me, okay? So it may not have been that much required till now with SQL, but when we talk about database design, it's highly abstract and you may need to talk to me to clarify various concepts. OK, so don't hesitate to catch me. Most of the time I'm online. OK, and if you send me a message, very likely I'll see it and respond to it almost immediately. OK, I would prefer that you reach out to me on Teams. But if you need to send an email, that's fine too. OK, so that's the idea here. Reach out to me, uh, speak to me about all of these things. OK, uh, but I do get occasionally uh, messages from students which says, Professor, I need help on assignment X. Okay? That means they're not saying I need help on a particular question on a particular assignment. I just need help on the assignments. Okay? Now, those kinds of things are difficult for me to entertain, right? Because you can reach out to me and say, look, I don't understand this concept. Okay? Or I don't understand these particular specific concepts. Right? You cannot just come and say, look, I'm having general trouble understanding stuff. OK, I can't sit down with you and go over the entire lecture again. OK, so you go through the lecture and whatever specific questions you have, 
feel free to ask me i can explain right but don't generally say i need help on the assignments and then expect me to sit with you and solve every single problem for you because that's of no use to you or me right because if i help you through the assignment you have not learned anything at all all you did was you completed an assignment without understanding anything okay so i am more than willing to help you with any specific questions you have specific concepts that you are not able to understand right but don't ask me for general guidance which is essentially to repeat the entire lecture so that's a very time consuming process and i've already done it it's all there in the form of videos okay so with that rant let me uh, continue what i'm uh, trying to do here okay so what i've done is i've just chosen uh, specific questions specific sql queries okay and i'm just going through them okay i think what i have selected are a good representative sample of sqls okay i have not chosen the very simple sqls like select star from the, you know that stuff you understand i am not going to spend time doing that okay but i have selected other instructive sqls uh, the first important point to note of course is that when you when your database is a relational database okay what it means is that the information has been separated out into multiple tables okay you're not putting all the information into one single table okay and there is some theory about how you separate information into multiple tables we'll talk about that in the latter part of the course <clears throat> okay so in this example that we took the first example you've got four tables okay you've got one table of storing information about suppliers another about projects a third about parts and a fourth table called shipments okay which is sort of giving information about various shipments that were made to this particular organization okay and what you note about the relational database is that in every table you have something called as the primary key okay so in the suppliers table the supplier number is your primary key okay so what's going on with supplier number is that every supplier has a unique supplier number right it's unique in the sense that no two suppliers have the same supplier number same thing with projects and parts okay so that is the the parallel of that in seton hall would be what every student has a unique what student id right in fact every employee of seton hall also has a unique id okay that's your eight digit id the number right alternately your short name uh, is also uh, a unique identifier okay so obviously that is what uniquely identifies a student or a supplier or a project or a part or anything okay so that's called as a primary key now the table shipments okay is the table that connects all these things together right so if you look at the very first shipment <coughs> okay it says that the supplier who made that shipment is the supplier s1 okay so only the primary key of that supplier is kept there all the other information that you may want about that supplier you can go to the supplier table and get all the extra information right so suppose you want to find out uh, in which city is that particular supplier located the supplier who made the first shipment right so you say okay this supplier's number is s1 let me go to the supplier table and i find that this supplier is located in london okay so it is the primary key that connects multiple tables okay so similarly you want to find out uh, what is the name of the part which was supplied in the first shipment okay so once again we say oh that part was part p1 let me go to the parts table and see oh the name of the part is not okay so relationships across tables are established through these primary keys okay so that's the basic idea of a relational database really theoretically there is nothing much more than this okay that every table has a primary key and connections across tables are made through primary key values that's it 
okay so now suppose we want uh, you know we've got this information and sql is the language used to extract information from these tables okay so the first query says get me all the details of the suppliers who are located in paris and who have a status of 20 or more okay now remember the supplier table has a column called city and it also has a column called status right in fact within your database that column is called s status not just status okay that is because in the oracle database the word status is a reserved word okay and it, the, the actual column is called s status okay so obviously what we want to do is we want to look at every single row and see if it satisfies this condition okay the first row doesn't satisfy the condition because the supplier is not from paris that supplier is from london so that's left out okay the second row doesn't satisfy the condition because the status is not 20 or more and so on and so on and therefore you find that the answer to that question is only one particular row okay so that's the mechanics of how sql works okay and the way in which you write the sql for this of course whenever you're retrieving information you use the select clause right so we say select star star means select all the columns okay i don't want to name specific columns just give me all the columns and then you first have to indicate which is the table from which you are selecting so obviously the table from which we want to get this information is called suppliers okay and then we want to see well what conditions must this satisfy in order to include this in the output well we want the city to be paris okay so you put the conditions in the where clause okay where city equals paris okay and notice that when you are extracting character information you put quotes okay so that is why you have the quotes around paris but that alone is not enough we also want the status to be more than 20 more than or 20 or more so we say s status greater than equal to 20 okay that's straightforward it's easy now why did i include greater than equal to why did i just not say greater than that's because 20 is allowed right because it says status of 20 or more right so equal to 20 is also acceptable greater than 20 is also acceptable so we say greater than or equal okay so that's a very straightforward easy uh, question yeah okay the reason i put two s's in status is if you look at the table that i gave you the name of that column is not status the name of the column is s status okay so here the picture is showing only status sorry uh, the picture is only showing status okay but the, within the table the actual column is called s status okay the reason i call the column s status is because oracle database does not allow me to have a column called status okay the database simply doesn't allow me to have the column it's using the word status to mean something else okay so that is the reason i had to put s status yeah you can use either of them they are equivalent okay you can use either single quotes or double quotes both will work correctly okay but i tend to just use single quotes as a matter of practice but both will work okay okay so any other questions okay so we are now the train has left the station let's move okay uh, the and condition of course says that both of these conditions must be satisfied okay instead suppose i had said get the details of suppliers who are from paris or who have a status of 20 or more then i would not have put and i would have put or okay so that's all okay uh, the next question says get me the names of the parts who have a weight between 10 and 15 okay in other words the weight is between 10 and 15 and we want only the names of the parts okay, we don't want everything else earlier we said select star this time we are saying i want only the names of the parts okay 
So basically, this is what we want, right? The weight should be between 10 and 15. So obviously, P1 is included, and therefore, nut is in the output. P2 is not included, because its weight is 17. It's not in this range, okay? And so on, okay? So that's the result that you see here. And the way to write this is, one way to write it is like this. Select P name, because we want only that column, from parts where weight is greater than or equal to 10, right? Weight is between 10 and 15. That means it's greater than or equal to 10 and less than or equal to 15. So that's what we've got here. <clears throat> weight is greater than or equal to 10 and weight less than or equal to 15. You cannot just say weight greater than or equal to 10 and less than or equal to 15. No, you have to say and weight is less than or equal to 15. You have to write the whole thing out. Right? That's because, see, SQL is a language. Okay, and like every language, it has a grammar. Only certain sentences are correct in this language, right? You cannot speak English and then not adhere to the English grammar, okay? But if you don't adhere tightly to the English grammar, it doesn't matter too much, okay? That is because as humans, we will understand, right? If I speak something ungrammatical, unless it's complete gibberish, you will still understand what I'm trying to say. But SQL is being interpreted by a computer. Okay, the computer doesn't have that intelligence that we may have. Okay, so because of that, your language has to uh, strictly conform to the grammatical structure. Okay, so that is why you may think that what you're saying is meaningful, but if it doesn't conform to the grammar of the language, the computer is going to say, no, I don't understand. Okay, it's going to come back and give you an error message and then of course, we can feel all insulted by it, but you know the computer is not able to understand. That's all it is. Okay. And another important thing that I'll tell you whenever it comes to using the computer is when you get an error message, right? When you do something and you get back an error message, there are two important things you need to understand. One is there's nothing to be alarmed about. Okay, there's nothing to be alarmed about. It's just telling you, look, I didn't understand what you said. Right? I didn't understand because it is it doesn't conform to the grammar that I understand. That's all the computer is telling you. Okay, so you don't have to feel bad about making these mistakes. Okay, we make mistakes all the time. I've been teaching SQL now for I don't know 25, 30 years. I still make mistakes when I write SQL. Nothing wrong about making mistakes. Okay. Uh, in fact, I said two, but I'm saying three. More importantly. If you don't make any mistakes, then there's a serious problem, right? When you're trying to learn something, if you're not making mistakes, that's a big problem because what it means is that you're not exploring. You're simply typing out whatever I have given you. Obviously, it'll work. It is supposed to work, okay? So you should be making mistakes only then you're learning, okay? So don't worry about making mistakes and also be creative, explore, try out something of your own. Don't restrict what you're trying out only to what I have given in the slide. Try other things. Think of something of your own. Try it out. Make a mistake. Go read the thing. Find out what's going on. Uh, that way you learn. <clears throat> okay. So the third important point about anything to do with computers is if the computer tells you something is wrong, then something is wrong. Okay. You have to first accept. Okay. I made a mistake. Only then your mind will allow you to go and look and find the mistake. Right? If you think, oh no, the computer is behaving uh, oddly, the computer is acting up today, it's not like that. It doesn't work like that. Right? Because computers are just machines. They're going to work the same way all the time. Okay? They don't just act up one day and then, uh, you know, same thing that works on another. Day. That doesn't work. Okay? So when you get an error message, you have to accept, okay, something is wrong. And then you look carefully, you'll find what is wrong. If you're not willing to accept something is wrong, you'll not find the mistake. Okay? So accept it, there's nothing wrong with making mistakes. Okay. This way of writing the, the query is correct, but it's a little verbose because there is another syntax just for this. Okay, a little more succinct, a little more clear. You can say where weight between 10 and 15. 
Okay, notice there is no is. It didn't say where weight is between 10 and 15. It just says where weight between 10 and 15. Okay. Why didn't they put is? It's just the grammar they chose, that's all. <clears throat> okay, yeah. No, no, between always includes. Okay, if you want exclusive, then you will have to go to writing the other way. Where weight greater than 10 and weight less than 15, then it will exclude the equals. Okay, there is no version of the between class which excludes, unfortunately. Okay, but it's a good question. Uh, maybe there is a way by which it can work, but normally it doesn't. Okay, so uh, this is the preferred way to do this. Okay, so now, you know, I'm assuming that these simple queries like the kind we've just discussed are easy. You've got it, so I'm not going to spend too much time on those. Okay, now I'm moving on to another kind of stuff which is called aggregate functions. Okay, so let's look at this. Suppose I ask you this question, how many suppliers are there overall? Okay, totally how many suppliers are there? Right? So the way to write that, of course, the answer is that, well, it's five. There are five suppliers, that's it. You just want to find out how many rows are there in that table. And the way to write that is like this, select count star. Okay, now the star out there basically says count how many rows there are. Okay, so when you see the letter, when you see the character star, just think of it as how many rows. Okay, so basically what we are saying is, tell me how many rows are there in the supplier's table. Okay, that's it. And it counts and says five. Okay, now this count is called as an aggregate function. Okay, now there is a qualitative difference between this query and queries we have looked at earlier, like this. Okay, the important characteristic of all the queries we have looked at up to now, except the last one, is that every row of the output can be traced back to a particular row of the input. Okay, so if you look at this query that I have, uh, that my slide is now showing, okay, we know that the first row of the output came from the first row of the input. Okay, we know that the second row of the output came from the third row of the input, etc. Okay, so there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the rows in the output and the rows in the input table that you're using. Okay, can we say the same thing here? Can we trace back any row of the output to a particular row of the input? No, right? Because this number five is not connected to any one row of the input. It's a combination of all of them. Okay, that is why this is called as an aggregate function. Okay, aggregate means what? Collection. It's based on many rows. It's not the output row is not based on a single input row, but it's based on many input rows. Okay, so that is what aggregate functions are used for. Okay. <coughs> Okay, so we are not counting any particular column. We are simply saying how many rows. So count star. Okay, now when you use aggregate functions, okay, if you see the output here, it says the title says count star. Okay, but we may want something more friendly. We can always use as. Okay, so we are saying select count star as supplier count. In other words, call that result as supplier count. Okay. Now you need quotes in this as supplier count only if there are spaces. In this case, there is a space, supplier space count, right? So because of that, you need quotes. If you didn't have any spaces, then you didn't need to put quotes either. Okay, so if it was, for example, supplier underscore count, then you could simply have said select count star as supplier underscore count without any quotes. <clears throat> Okay, so the quotes are required only because there are spaces. <clears throat> okay, 
And in fact, you can do this for any column of the output. Not only for aggregates, usually it's done for aggregates, but you can do this for any column. Okay, so now we are getting into interesting territory. Here we are saying, get us the city names, that is the name of the city, and how many suppliers are there in each city? Okay, so we want the city name followed by how many suppliers are there in each city. Okay, so this is kind of like this. It's kind of like the previous question, except that in the previous question, we simply counted the total number of rows. Okay, here we are saying count the number of rows for each city separately. Okay, in other words, we are saying count the number of rows for London, count the number of rows for Paris and Athens. Okay, so this is also counting, but we are not counting the whole table, we are counting subsets. Okay, so we are saying London, two, Paris, two, Athens, one. That's it. Okay, so you do this by using count star. Okay, except that we are saying select city and then count star. Okay, because the question says, show me the city names and the number of suppliers in each city. Okay, so obviously the output has to contain two columns. It has to contain city and it has to contain how many suppliers there are in that city. Okay, so that is why the select has two columns because the output requires two columns. Okay, then we can say from suppliers. That's easy. But now we want to tell the system We want to tell the system, don't just count the total number of rows for the entire table. Instead, for every different value of city, count the number of rows separately. Okay, that's what we want. So you achieve that by saying group by city. Okay, in other words, what we're saying is, Take the suppliers table and conceptually separate the suppliers from each city. Treat it as each, you know, each uh, city as a separate group. Okay, so London's, the suppliers in London are one group, the suppliers in Paris are another group, etc. And then apply the count function, count star function to each group separately. Okay, that is what the group by. Does. Group by creates groups. Okay, so if you say group by city, what it's going to do is it's going to take every city and treat the rows for that city as a separate group. And then any aggregate function you have is going to be applied separately to each group. Okay, if you don't have a group by, okay, then like in the previous example, then the aggregate function is applied to the entire table. If you have a group by, it's applied separately for each group. Okay, so obviously this is the result that you're going to get what you're seeing on top there, right? Because you see that there are two suppliers from London, two from Paris and two from Athens. That's what we got, okay? Now, one important point is, right? Whenever you have, so in, if you look at this select cost, Right, if you look at this select clause, you see that it has two columns, two entities, right? One is called city and the other is count star, okay? Now city is not an aggregate, right? Because city is just a column. It's not an aggregate function like count, okay? Whereas count star is aggregate, okay? So when you have a select statement in which you've got a mix of aggregates and non-aggregates, okay? Like this example, city is not aggregate, count star is aggregate. So whenever you have a mix of aggregate and non-aggregate, then you have to always group by all the non-aggregates. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense, okay? 
So this is a very important point to understand. And that's what I'm trying to uh, discuss it. Uh, discuss here. OK, so take a look at this. SQL query. OK, it says select supplier number count star from suppliers. OK. What output do you expect from something like this? Yeah. So how many values of supplier number are there? There are five. Right, S1, S2, S3, S4, S5. There are five values of supplier number. And how many values of count star are there? There's only one value, right? Because you have not said any group by. Count star is on one value five, whereas supplier number is five different values. Okay. Now, when you say select A comma B, you expect equal number of values for A and B, right? Because every row will have one value for A, one value for B. The second row will have, third row will have, right? So there has to be a match in how many elements are there for every column you have selected. It has to match. Whereas in this case, it doesn't match. Okay, so this query makes no sense at all. Right, because there are five supplier numbers and there's only one count star. It doesn't make sense. Right? Because if you say select columns one, two, three, four, five, all of them have to have equal numbers of values. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense, right? So therefore, okay, this doesn't make any sense at all. Okay, therefore, whenever your select class has aggregate and non-aggregate mixed up, okay, then you always have to group by all the non-aggregates, okay? Which is why when you say, uh, like here, when you say group by city, okay? So now how many values does city have? Only three values, right? Because you have said group by city. So there are three cities, London, Paris, and Athens. And how many count stars are there? Three. Because you have one count for London, one count for Paris, one count for Athens. So now it matches up. OK, so this is a very important point that I'm making in this particular slide. Whenever you have aggregates and non aggregates mixed up in a select class. You always have to group by all the non aggregates, all the non aggregates. OK, otherwise your query will not make sense. OK, so pay, pay close attention to this particular slide. OK. So now we are saying, get me the names of the cities and the average status of the suppliers from each city, right? In other words, London, what is the average status? Paris, what is the average status? Athens, what is the average status? That's what we want, okay? Now that by itself is quite easy, right? Because just like we did select city, comma, count star, I'll simply have to say city, comma, average of status. OK, that's easy. But what we are only what we are additionally saying is list only the cities whose average status is greater than 20. I don't want you to list all the cities. OK, so in other words. This is the first step, which is. Get me the city and the average status. OK, so the average status for London is 20. There are two Londons, both are 20. The average status for Paris is uh, also 20 because one is 30, the other is 10, and the average for Athens is 30. Okay, that's the first stage, <coughs> which is every city and its average status. But then we are also saying, I don't want to see all the cities. I only want to see cities whose average status is greater than 20. Okay, London and Paris are not greater than 20. They are equal to 20, so they go out. Only Athens is left behind. OK. So how we do this is like this. OK, so sorry. Uh, we say select city average status and I just put an as average status from suppliers group by city. OK, so up to that, if you leave out the last line, 
the result you get is this mini middle table. Okay, that's the result you get. But what we also want to say is, well, show me only those cities who have an average status greater than 20. So I said, having average status greater than 20. Okay, now notice I did not say where average status greater than 20. Okay, I didn't say where average status, I said having average status. Okay, so you should really understand the difference between when do you use where, when do you use having. Okay, that difference you must understand very clearly. Okay, you use where when you are filtering from the original rows. Okay, like I want all the suppliers from London. So you say where city equals London. Or I want all the suppliers whose status is above 15, where status greater than 50. Okay, but when you are filtering from among the groups, right? So here what we did was we calculated the average status for every city, right? And we are now filtering from among that one, not from the original rows, but from the grouped data, right? So when we are filtering among groups, then you use having. When you're filtering among original rows, then you use where. Okay, so this is very important for you to, uh, for you to grasp. The difference between where and having. Okay, so does anyone have any questions about the difference between where and having? Uh, I have a question, Professor. Yeah, please. Um, for under having, how it says average S status, don't you need an S after suppliers in the from section? Um, oh, yeah. Okay, you're saying select city, comma, again, there also average should be S status, right? Uh, yeah, but uh, isn't that the uh, the alias thing, how you need to label it first? Okay, see, you need, uh, in fact, here, notice that for suppliers, I have not provided any alias. Yeah. Okay, so there's no need to use any alias because I have not, you know, I have not really created any alias for suppliers. But the more important point is, you will use the alias, okay, only when there is an ambiguity, right? Mm -hmm. If there are two columns with the same name, then you will have to use the alias to indicate which one you are using, okay? We'll come to that. So that alias thing will, will arise only when we are doing joins. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah, but it says average S status. Is that just yeah, yeah, is that's the S? Mistake. It should oh, be just, oh, it's just a typo? Oh, okay. It's a typo. It, oh, you're okay. right there. I mean, I should have fixed this. It should okay. say select city average S status, not just status. Okay, that's a mistake on my part. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay. Yeah, so this slide is mainly about the difference between where and having. That's very important, okay? So any, any other questions on the difference between where and having? Okay, so now let's move on to, uh, so this is something that's very important. You need to pay attention to this, okay? So now we are saying, Give me the details of all parts which are either green or blue. Okay. So you want to obviously get this. Some of them are green, some of them are blue. Only the green and blue ones figure out. The red ones are filtered out. Okay. There are two ways to write this. One way is to say select star from parts where color equals green or color equals blue. Okay. This is fine. There's nothing wrong with this. Except that if you have five or six or seven different alternatives, then you'll have to say where color equals green, all color equals blue, all color equals white, all color equals red, all color equals yellow. You know, it becomes very verbose. A more succinct way of saying that is to use the in keyword. Okay, so you can say select star from parts where color in, and then within parentheses, you just list all the values. Okay. In this particular case, you know, they're okay. But if you have three or four or five different options, then the in approach becomes easier. 
Okay, so it's just a matter of preference. Both are correct. The one on the right is just uh, more succinct. It's easier. And it's also, you know, suppose you write this query and then think, oh, you know what? I also in want to include yellow and green. Right? In the first approach, you'll have to then say, and color equals yellow, and color equals green. You're simply repeating so much. Whereas here, you can just go and within the parentheses, add the additional stuff and you're done. Okay, so it's just a more preferred approach. Okay, so here we are saying, get me the supplier number and the status of suppliers whose names begin with S, uppercase. Okay, again, not very useful in this context, but uh, you know, many times you have to process these kinds of things. Okay, so here you use uh, wild cards. Okay, so you say you use like, right? Select supplier numbers S status, which is correct, from suppliers. Okay, and this time we are saying where's S name, supplier name. I'm not saying is equal to S percent. Okay, I'm saying supplier name equals uh, is like S percent. Okay, so the percent will match any number of characters, zero or more characters. Okay, so as long as the first letter is S, this matches. Okay, even if there's only one letter, supplier whose name is just S, even then it match matches. Okay, so the like function is used, uh, the like keyword is used for this kind of stuff. Okay, so just, you know, some kind of character processing is important. OK, so the percent wildcard matches zero or more characters. <coughs> OK, so the next one says. Get me the uh, supplier number and status of suppliers whose name has S anywhere, lowercase s anywhere inside it. OK, so that's clearly just a small extension. We can say it's like percent s percent. Right, so any number of characters, zero or more, followed by lowercase s, followed again by zero or more characters. So that means S is somewhere in it, that's all. Okay, so this, this matches that. Okay, again, I'm rushing through these because it's not all that, uh, all that complicated. Okay, finally, we are saying, give me the supply number and status of suppliers whose name has L, lowercase L, has the second character. So you'll say this, underscore. You'll use the underscore wildcard an underscore matches exactly one character. Okay, so we are saying the supplier name has any character followed by L. Okay, which means, and then followed by any number of other characters. Right, so this will match only if the L is exactly in the second place. Okay, so just some functions for, uh, you know, manipulating these kinds of things. Okay. So now we get to the somewhat more complicated parts of SQL, right? And this is central to relational databases, right? Because in relational databases, you're splitting up the data into multiple tables, okay? And you can achieve useful things only when you combine different tables, okay? And there's a way to do that. So here we are saying for every shipment, Right? Remember, shipment has supplier number, part number, project number, date, and quantity. Okay, so we are saying for every sub shipment, get me the supplier name. Instead of supplier number, I want the actual name of the supplier, and then I want part number and shipment quantity. Okay, so the first thing you have to look at whenever you have to extract any information, first thing you have to think about is, well, which table or tables are going to provide me what information I want? Okay, until now we didn't bother about it because all the information is coming from just one table. Okay, either the supplier table or the parts table. But everything in every query we used only one table, right? But here I'm saying I want the supplier name, which can come only from the supplier table. And then I want the part number and the quantity, which can come only from the shipment table. Okay. So now I have the task of joining two tables in order to answer the question, okay? So the first thing you need to always think about is, well, which are the tables I need to use for this query? Sometimes it will be just one table, 
no problem. If it's more than one, then you have to think about how am I going to connect them up, okay? So what's going on here is, first of all, you have the shipments table, okay? Now remember, for the first shipment, the supplier is S1. S1 is the supplier, okay? Now in order to get that supplier's name, right, I have to attach S1 to the first row, right? Because the first row has the supplier as S1, and to get the supplier's name from there, I have to attach that piece of that particular row to the first row of shipment. Okay, the second row also is supplier S1. So again, I attach S1 to it. Okay, the third row is S2. So I attach the details of S2 and so on and on and on. Okay, so literally what I've done is for every shipment, I have brought in the corresponding supplier row and attached it to the shipment. Okay, this process is what is called joining two tables, right? You join two tables and that's what you get, okay? So now it's easy for me to say, pick out the supplier name. Okay, I can get the supplier name and then pick out the sub part number. Okay, I can take out the part number, right? Because what you have done by joining is you have created this master table, a big table with columns from both the tables. And now you're simply picking off the required columns that you want, it's easy, okay? So that's really what joining is all about, okay? Of course, you join based on some particular column, right? Obviously, you're going to join these two tables, the shipments table and the supplier table, obviously using the supplier number. That's what is common to both of those tables. Okay, now in this particular case, the column names are also the same. Okay. It is S number in both the tables. Sometimes the column names may be different, right? So for example, it is possible that in the supplier table, the column is called supplier number, S number. And in the shipments table, it may be called supplier underscore number, okay? It's possible, okay? They don't have to have the same name but so long as you know that both represent the same thing, that's enough, okay? So conceptually, what a join does is it creates this master table or a super table, and then from that, you select whatever columns you want, okay? So you just pick up the supplier name, and then you pick up the uh, part number, et cetera. Okay, so that's the result, okay? So the important thing is whenever you see some requirement for retrieving information, okay, you first find out which tables can give me this information, right? If it's only one table, no problem. If it's multiple tables, you figure out how am I going to join them? And then you pull out whatever you want. Very straightforward, okay? So conceptually, you really need to pay a lot of attention to this particular slide because everything else that comes after this is based on this. If this is the key idea. Everything else is just a derivative of this key idea. Okay. The way you write it is like this. Select S name, part number, quantity, because I want the supplier name, part number, and shipment quantity. But this time, I can't say just from one table, right? Because I'm selecting from a joined multiple tables. So I'm saying don't just select from one table, but select from this super table, which results from joining the two, okay? So we say from suppliers join shipments, right? So that is take the supplier table, take the shipments table, join them. Well, how do I join them? I'm going to join them by seeing whenever the supplier dot supplier number is equal to the shipments dot supplier number. Right? That is what says, these are the columns I need to match from the two tables, okay? <clears throat> and then- I, I got a question. Sure. So like if, we, if we're not using left join or right join, yeah, does it matter uh, the order in which you, you join him? So can you say select 
da, 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 from shipments join suppliers or you got to be from suppliers join shipments no order doesn't matter right. if you're not doing left or right order doesn't matter all right thank you okay so what you said is completely correct you could have said shipments join suppliers or suppliers join shipments same thing okay no difference at all okay thank thanks for asking that's a good question okay so that's it okay so this is all join is all about right and a lot of sql is about join so that's why we want to really make sure we understand this very clearly okay so now what is happening is that this query has become very verbose right we are saying suppliers join shipments on suppliers start supplier number equal shipments start supplier number there a lot of writing that we, that's going on here okay it's a real pain to sit down and write so much the preferred way to write these things is to create an alias for each of the tables okay so we are saying select supplier name part number quantity from suppliers s join shipments sp okay in other words what we are saying is well i want to join the two tables suppliers and shipments but going forward i'm not going to call them suppliers and shipments instead i'm going to call them s and sp respectively okay so the s and sp are what are called as aliases okay now there is nothing there is no hard and fast rule about how you create aliases right i could have said from suppliers cat join shipments that no problem it's just a name you chose whatever name you choose is fine right but obviously we don't want to choose completely nonsensical names because the whole idea of giving an alias is to make your query more easily readable okay so it makes sense to call suppliers s and shipments sp rather than some nonsense stuff okay and then we say on s dot s number equals sp dot s number okay because having given the alias s and sp we can now use the aliases instead of spelling out the complete name okay now in this particular scenario giving an alias is just a convenience it's not necessary it's not a must if you prefer to write out the whole thing you can do so there is nothing wrong okay but there are other situations that we'll encounter later where you have no choice but to give an alias we'll see those later on okay uh, <clears throat> okay so that's about giving aliases okay now we come to an important point here when you joined suppliers and shipments right you joined suppliers and shipments now notice that suppliers s3 and s5 don't figure at all okay in the suppliers table we have s1 s2 s3 s4 s5 but the moment you did this join you see that s3 and s5 are not appearing at all okay so why is that the case why is that we don't see s3 or s5 exactly right they have not made any shipments okay we have got those two suppliers sitting in our suppliers table but if you go and look at the people who have made shipments s3 and s5 have made no shipments okay therefore when you say you join the two tables on s dot s number equals sp dot s number well s1 and s3 don't figure in uh, or uh, sorry s3 and s5 don't figure in shipments so there is no match okay so those particular rows are not joined at all because there is no match okay so this is how join works when you say join just the word join this is how it works if there is a match it's going to join otherwise it's going to get ignored okay so this is what is called as in in technical terms it's called as an inner join okay, they call it an inner join and it works only when 
there are matches whatever there is no match thrown out ignored okay but there are some situations when we want even in the case of a no match we want something to be shown okay so for example it's not unreasonable to say well show me a report of uh, you know supplier name part number and shipment quantity but for suppliers who don't have any shipments just show the name and leave everything else blank okay that's not an unreasonable request right so in those cases join will not work okay so this is called an inner join okay uh, so we'll come to that shortly the next question says for every shipment get the part name project name supplier name and the shipment quantity okay in other words what we want is all the names okay so in order to get the part name we have to join the shipment table with the parts table that's what has happened here in order to get the project name we want to join it with the project table and in order to get the supplier name we have to join it with the supplier table. okay so really to answer this particular question you need to join all the tables right you have to join shipments table with suppliers for supplier name parts for part name projects for project name okay so when you join you may actually have to join many tables okay so the way you will write this and then once you join it you can then select the required columns okay so the way you would write it is like this select part name project name supplier name quantity from shipments join parts p join projects j join suppliers s okay so in fact in you know when you look at real world applications many tables are usually involved okay you may join easily 10 15 tables may be joined in order to get a particular result when you are just using join the order doesn't matter okay so again just like the previous question order doesn't matter we could have put these tables in any order no problem right but it will start mattering when you do other kinds of joins okay <clears throat> okay so now we are saying i'm bringing in one other aspect list the name and city in other words the supplier name and the city for every supplier who has made at least one shipment okay now what does it mean to say a supplier has made at least one shipment all it means is to say the supplier number appears in the shipments table that's all right because only those suppliers who have made shipments who appear in the shipments table if they have not made any shipment they don't figure in the shipments table that's all okay so one way to do this is like this we join it right we join the two tables supplier and uh, shipment okay and then we pick out select s name city from shipments sp join etc okay and that gives this result okay this result is sort of correct but extremely verbose right because why do you have to say smith london smith london so many times right it's it's enough if we make this if we show the supplier number and supplier name and city once for each supplier we don't have to repeat it okay it's getting repeated because the same supplier has made many shipments and it's getting repeated okay so to prevent useless repetition like this okay you use distinct okay so the moment you say distinct it won't show duplicate rows okay so you have to be careful you have to be aware of situations where duplicates could arise and in those cases if you don't want the duplicates you have to say distinct <coughs> okay 
Okay, so just be sensitive to when you have to use distinct. Okay, so if you do that, duplicates will go away. Okay, so here we are saying select the supplier number, supplier name, and the number of shipments for every supplier who has made at least one shipment. Okay, that is for every supplier who appears in the shipments table, we want to find out the supplier name and how many shipments they made. Okay, for example, S1 has made two shipments, S2 has made several shipments, S4 has made two shipments. That's all we want. Okay, and the way to write this is like this, select. Now here is where an important point occurs, which somebody was trying to point out earlier. Select S dot S number, S name, count star as number of shipments. From suppliers S, join shipments SP, and the order doesn't matter. We could have said shipments first and suppliers later. On SP dot S number equals S dot S number. And we said group by S dot S number and S name. Okay, so a couple of important points. Notice that in this case, within the select clause, I said select S dot S number. I did not just say select S number. Okay, so why do you think that is happening? Why S dot S number? Okay, this is very important to understand. Right, that is because when you join suppliers and shipments, right? When you join the two tables, suppliers and shipments, the table suppliers has a column called S number. The table shipments also has a column called S number, okay? And therefore, the joined table has two columns called S number, okay? So if you simply said select S number, then Oracle is going to say, well, I don't know which S number you're talking about. There are two S numbers, okay? So the S number becomes ambiguous because there are two columns called S number. So in that case, unless you tell the system specifically which S number you're talking about, it will come back and say ambiguous. S number is ambiguous, right? So if you have two columns with the same name, then you have to say from which particular one are you referring to, okay? So therefore, I said S dot S number. I could easily well have said SP dot S number. It would have been the same thing, right? Because the two are matched anyway. Okay, so that is important to understand. That whenever you see the system coming back and telling you something is ambiguous, right? If you see that word ambiguous in the error message, then you know exactly what the problem is. The problem is that you've joined two tables. They have a column with the same name. But in your select clause, you have not indicated which column you're talking about. That's all. Okay. And the second important point to note here in this particular query is we said group by S dot S number and S name. Right. So what is going on here is you've got if you look at the select clause, you've got two non-aggregates and one aggregate. Right, S dot S number is not aggregate, S name is not aggregate, count star is aggregate, okay? Whenever you have non-aggregates and aggregates mixed up in the select clause, you always have to group by all the non-aggregates, all the non-aggregates, not just one of them, okay? So that is why you're grouping by both S dot S number and S name, okay? So that's very important to note. If you group by just one of them, Oracle will come back and give you an error message. Okay, or if you make, if you completely omit grouping, then also you'll get an error message. Right, it'll say there is a mismatch. Okay. So what you should do really is try out a query deliberately which has a mistake. You know, leave out the group by and then put this. Okay, or don't group by all the columns and then see what happens. Then you'll know when you see, when you get that error, you know why it's happening. Okay, you should try it out. 
Okay. Next one is simple. It just says list the supplier names and the corresponding total quantity and average quantity. Okay. This is only to show you that you can have multiple aggregates in an SQL query. Okay. So I'm saying select S name, some quantity, average quantity. Okay. So sum is one aggregate function, average is another aggregate function, AVG. Count is also an aggregate function. Okay. So you can have more than one aggregate function in your select, no problem. Okay. But of course, you've got aggregates and non aggregates mixed up. You have to group by all the non aggregates, which is S name. <clears throat> okay. So now we move into a different territory. Here we are saying select the supplier name, part number, project number, and quantity. Okay, for every supplier who has made at least one shipment, all that is easy. This is what we've been doing up to now. Okay, you have to join suppliers and uh, pro suppliers and shipments, and pick out whatever you want. Easy. Okay, but an additional requirement is coming along. It says for suppliers who have not made any shipments. Okay, include only the supplier name. Leave the other things blank. Right? Other things meaning part number, project number, quantity, leave those blank. Okay. So this, you cannot get this if you just did a regular join. Okay. So this is what I had pointed out earlier, right? If you just joined now, and if you say select S name, part number, part project number, quantity, and you did the regular thing, okay? Then your result is going to be just this, okay? But the result contains only those suppliers who have made shipments. We already know there are two suppliers, S3 and S5, who have not made any shipments, right? So what the system is telling you is that I want Blake and Adams to come, right? I want it like this, okay? We want to also add Blake and Adams, but of course, they have no corresponding shipments, so leave those things blank. Okay, so that's what we want, right? We want Blake and Adams to be listed, but since they have not made any shipments, part number, project number, quantity will all be empty. I just wrote null in my output. I wrote null, but it's just blank. Okay, when you execute it in SQL, you'll just see blank. Okay, so in this case, what we are saying is, I'm joining two tables, suppliers and shipments, but one table takes priority. Meaning, if it has no match with the other tables, still it should appear in the output, right? We are somehow saying I'm joining suppliers and shipments, but the supplier table is somehow more important. Even if there's no match, show me everything from the supplier table. That's exactly what we are saying. Okay, so this is where you will use what is called as outer join. Inner join will not do the job for us. Okay, so we will write it like this. We say left join. Okay, why left join? Well, when you're listing the tables, you're first saying suppliers then you're saying shipments, okay? And the table that has supposed to take priority is the one that you mentioned first, okay? So when you want the first table to take priority, you say left join. When you want the second table to take priority, you will say right join, okay? So that's all. So the moment you said suppliers, left join, you're saying my suppliers table is supposed to take priority, that means even if there is no match for a given supplier in the shipments table, I still want that supplier to be listed in my output. That's what is called as an outer join. Okay. <clears throat> so the table mentioned first is considered left, second is considered right. Okay. So if you do this, then you get the desired result. Okay. <clears throat> okay.
Okay. Now, of course, in this uh, output, I have shown the words null, null. In reality, when you execute it, you'll just see blank. Okay. I just put null just to emphasize the fact that it's called null. Okay. Now, the same thing, you could write it with a right join also. Okay. But as I said, if it's a right join, then you will put the suppliers table second. That's all. Right, so it's it's just a question of, well, there's one table on the left, one table on the right. Which one do you want to take priority? If the one on the left is to take priority, you say left join. If the one on the right is to take priority, you say right join. That's it. Okay, so you have a choice. Both of the queries that I have written here are equivalent. Okay, the second one I said right join because suppliers is the second. In the first time I said left join because suppliers is the first. That's it. OK, so this is important to understand also the difference between a regular join and an outer join like left or a right join. <clears throat> yeah. No, you can. We will see an example of that later. OK, you'll have to carefully put it in, but you can do it. <clears throat> we'll see one example that's going to come up. OK, so here we are saying this is the names of suppliers who have made no shipments? OK. <clears throat> now, what does it mean for a supplier? Who has not made any shipments? How will you find out those suppliers? Right. Earlier we said a supplier who has made at least one shipment means that supplier number appears in the shipment state. OK, if a supplier has made no shipments, that means the supplier number doesn't appear in the shipments table at all. OK, it's just missing from the shipments table. That's what it is. OK, now how will you find out which supplier numbers are missing in the shipments table? OK, so the trick we are going to do is an extension of what we did in the previous question. Well, so what we are going to do is. We are going to first join the two tables. I mean, join the two tables, supplier and shipment. Right, and then only select those rows in which the supplier number in the shipments table is missing. Okay, that's what we're going to do. So look at this answer here. Okay, so here we have done a join of the two tables. Okay, and we have given priority to the supplier table, which is why Blake and Adams appear, but all the shipment details for them are null. OK. So we have done the outer join and then we're going to say select supplier name from shipments SP. Right join suppliers S because I want to give priority to suppliers. OK, so up to now it's all easy, but the next line is the crux. OK, so now we are coming and saying Select only those rows where the supplier number in the shipment table is null. <coughs> okay, so we are saying the supplier number in the shipment table is null. So that will select only Blake and Adams. OK, and those are the two guys, two suppliers who have made no shipments. Right, so effectively we are saying. Find out all those suppliers for whom there is no match in the shipments table. That's what we are saying. OK. So why this also is. Use, yeah, uh, why would you use where here instead of having? OK, having only applies when you've got aggregates. OK. See where you will use when you're selecting from rows. Having you will use when you're selecting from groups. Right, if you have done a group by. And you want to only select some of the groups, that is when you use having. OK, so if you go back and look at the having example, you will see that. So here we are only selecting from the rows, right? You join the two tables and you said, give me all the rows where the sp.s number is null. 
So you're not selecting among groups. Having comes only when you're selecting among groups. Okay, any, any other questions? Did that clarify your, uh, clarify it for you? Yeah, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so this is very important. Pay real attention to this particular slide because this is a very useful technique. Okay, so now we've done a lot of examples with our supplier parts projects database. And there's another database also that we've been working with in the course, and that is uh, the college database where you have students, courses, instructors, sections, and registrations. Okay, now the reason I'm bringing up this particular database is that this database has a characteristic that the previous database did not have. Okay, so particularly here, Notice that the primary key of the sections table, okay, consists of two columns, right? You identify a section uniquely by the course ID and the section name together, right? Because the course ID alone doesn't identify a section because the course may have many sections, okay? Just like in Seton Hall, right? You've got course, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, BITM 2701, but that course may have many, many sections. A, 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 B, A, C, A, D, et cetera, many sections, right? So if I just say 2701, I don't know which section you're talking about. If I say 2701, section A, A, then I know what you're talking about, okay? So the primary key for the sections table consists of both of those columns, course ID and section name. Okay, so therefore, suppose I want to find out for the section 10AA, that is course ID 10, section name AA, for that particular section, how many students are registered? Okay, so for that, I have to join the two tables, sections and registrations, right? because registrations is what tells me for every section which student has registered. So if I look at it, I can say for 10 AA, there are two, two students, the first two rows. Oh no, there are three students, the first three rows, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five. There are five students who, have, six students who have registered for that particular section, the first six rows, okay? Now, the important point is when you join the sections and the registrations tables, okay, you will have to join them on both of those columns, right? So you will have to say join sections S, uh, you know, sections S join registrations R on S dot course ID equals R dot course ID and S dot section name equals R dot section name. Okay, so sometimes you will have to join two tables on more than one column. That's the important part about this particular database. Okay, and it happens a lot. Okay, so you shouldn't assume that you will join tables only on one column. Sometimes it may be more than one column. It can even be three or four columns. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so this is not important. Get the first letter of the first name and the largest thing, and you use the substring function. Okay, there's a function called sub str, and you know, first name one one. <clears throat> okay, first letter, meaning starting from one, one letter, and the whole of the last name. Okay, that's easy. Okay, and then it says list each alphabet and the number of students whose last name begins with each alphabet, right? Meaning how many students' name starts with A, B, C, D, etc. Okay, so here we are seeing uh, select the substring, meaning the first letter of the last name, uh, and then group it. 
Okay, so you're grouping by the first letter. You don't have to group by just one column. Uh, you can group by particular letter as well. Okay, and this is going to give you the results. And uh, I also said order by, okay, which is to control the sequence in which the output is listed. Okay, I just showed this to introduce the sub str function to you. That's all. Okay, and then here we are just saying some stuff like uh, get me the height to weight ratio for each student, height divided by weight, and list the result in descending order of the ratio. Okay, so again, what are all I'm trying to point out here is that in your select clause, okay, you can have some columns which are calculated numbers as well. Okay, it doesn't have to be just one column. It can be A by B or A plus B or A times B plus C, whatever you like. Okay, so that's what it is. And I gave it an alias, HW ratio. And you can also order by some particular calculated value. Okay, so this is just to say that the, the columns in the select can be computed values. Okay, so. And another point you're seeing is when you do computations, right, it's going to compute correct to many, many decimal places, right? So you may want to round it off, and that's what I'm showing here. Okay, round H height divided by weight to three decimal places. Okay, so you can use the round function and round it off if you want, and that's what you're seeing in the result. Okay, I got so a question. Can, yeah. How do you differentiate between order by and group by? Okay, order by only affects the ordering of the results, right? Whereas group by, what you're saying is, take all the values that you're grouping by. So for example, if I say group by city, okay? It's going to take all the rows that have one particular city, put them into one group. All the rows that have another city, put them into a different group. And then it's going to compute whatever uh, aggregate you're computing separately for each group, okay? So when you do group by, the number of rows in the output is going to become reduced, right? Because if I say group by city, I may have 10,000 rows, but I may have only five different cities. So in my output, only five rows will come up, okay? Whereas order by doesn't do any of these grouping stuff. Order by simply says, okay, I've got the results. I'm going to display it in a different order. That's all, okay? So if I have 10,000 rows and I say order by, I'm still going to get 10,000 rows. Whereas if I have 10,000 rows and I say group by, and there are only five groups, the output will contain only five rows, okay? So you should take a look at the examples that I have for order by and group by, okay? And then try it out. Then you will understand the difference, okay? If I say order by city, then it's going to simply order the results by ascending order of city. If I say group by city, then it's going to treat each city as a separate group. Okay, good question, but uh, you know, you should look at, try it out and see what difference uh, comes about. <clears throat> okay, so here it says for each section, list the course name, section name and instructor name. Okay, so first, obviously, you have to join the uh, course with section to get the course name. And then you have to join it with instructors to get the instructor name. Okay, so this is straightforward. Saying select course name, section name, first name, last name. That is the instructor first name, last name. And then you're doing all the normal things. Okay, but here what I'm going to do is uh, OK, so I'm just showing, forget this. This is just uh, joining on different orders. This is important. Here I'm saying for instructors who are not teaching any section, OK, and there are such instructors in this database. For instructors who are not teaching any sections, include just the instructor's names. OK, so again, this is the left join aspect that is coming into play, right? But when you have multiple tables, just like she was asking, when you have multiple tables, you have to be careful about the left joins and the right joins. 
Okay, so we might write it like this. Okay, select course name, section name, first name, last name from instructors I. Okay, and we want to give priority to instructors, so I say left join sections S. And on and on. Okay, because we are trying to say for instructors who are not teaching any courses, include just the names. Okay, but if you if you do this, this is the result you get. OK, and this result is not doing what we want it to do, right? Because we said for instructors who are not teaching any section, include the names, OK? But it turns out that there are two instructors who are not teaching any sections, but they have not figured here in the output. OK, now that is happening because first you are joining instructors with sections. OK. And that is fine. All the instructors will appear there. But for instructors who are not teaching any courses, right, the course ID and section name will be null, right? So if you consider only the first two joins, that is joining of instructors and sections, okay? That that will be a proper left join with all the instructors appearing. But subsequently, when you take that and join it with courses, okay? Then there is no match with the courses. That is just a regular join. Okay, and therefore the instructors will get filtered out. Okay, so one option is to make the second one also a left join. That will work. Or you can change the order. Okay, so this I'm just explaining here why this didn't work correctly. Okay, you can change the order. OK, so you can say first I join sections and courses. And then right join instructors. Okay, then obviously instructors will get priority. It will come. OK, or alternately I'm showing another way which you don't really need to worry about. Right, I'm saying. You know. Do the second join, put it in parentheses. Right, so that it first performs the second join. And then it joins with instructors that will also work. OK, so this is something uh, it's explained in the video, so it's something that you need to go back and take a look at where when you're joining multiple tables. And you're performing left joints and right joints, you need to be a little more careful as to the order. <clears throat> OK, so this particular question, there's nothing, nothing different from what we have discussed. Now, since we are a little short of time, I'm just going to skip through this one. OK, so this is again nothing different. I'm going to skip this. OK, so here we are saying for each game. List the game ID. And the names of the participating teams. OK, this is a tricky one. Right, that is because if you look at the schema, right? If you look at the tables here. OK, the games table has first team ID, second team ID. Right, because after all, a game occurs between two teams. OK, so it's got the first team ID and it's got the second team ID. Right, and in order to get the first team name and the second team name, we have to join games with teams. OK, but we have to join it twice. Once to get the first team's name. And second to get the second team's name. OK, so this is what is important, right? So you have to join where the first team ID is the team ID, right? So here you've got three, three, you've got two, two, etc. First it's joined by first team ID, and then it's joined again by second team ID. Okay, notice that the second team ID is seven, seven, six, six, etc. Okay, so sometimes the same table has to be joined multiple times, right? Like, You've got the games table, but the teams table is being joined twice to the games table. Once to get the first team's name, and again to get the second team's name. 
Okay, this is not common, somewhat rare, but it's possible. Okay, so then of course you can get the uh, results from this. Okay, but the way to write this is tricky. Okay, so this is all just showing the mechanics of how the result arrive, comes about. Okay, so you're joining games with teams once to get the first team and games with teams second time. So the first join says select G dot game ID from games G. Okay. And join teams T1. Okay. That is because you're going to join games with teams twice. Each time you give it a different alias. Okay. So from games G, join teams T1 on G dot first team ID equals T1 dot team ID. Okay. And then join it again with teams T2 on G dot second team ID equals T2 dot team ID. Okay. So this example illustrates a couple of things. One thing is that the, the column names that you're joining on may not be the same, right? Because the team ID is called first team ID in the games table, and it's just called team ID in the teams table. Okay. And secondly, you may have to join more than once. Okay. Now this, of course, admittedly is a rare occurrence but it's possible that this can happen. <clears throat> okay, and this is just another example of where the same table maybe may have to be joined more than once. Okay, in this case, it is to get the captain's name and the player's name. Okay, because the captain's name is going to come from the player's table and the player's name is also going to come from the player's table. Okay, so this example is just another example for the same point that I made. Okay, so we won't spend much time on that. <clears throat> okay, so this is, I'll skip through this since we are close to 8.30. Okay, so here we are saying for each game, list the names of the two teams that played and the name of the winning team. Okay, now notice that in the games table, we only have the points scored by each team. Okay, so the winning team may either be team one, first team ID, or it could be team two, depending on who got more points. Okay, so this again illustrates yet another aspect. Okay, and we can go directly to the. Okay, let's go to the answer and then we'll talk. Okay, here. Yeah. Notice this. Okay, here we are saying select T1 dot team name as first team, T2 dot team name as second team. Right? Because obviously you're going to join for getting the team's name, you're going to join it twice. That is fine. And then right, whether to uh, which team is the winning team. Okay, but that depends upon who scored more points. OK, and therefore in the select clause, I'm introducing case. Right, so case says it's a conditional, right? So it's saying when the first team points are greater than the second team points, then put T1 dot team name. Otherwise put T2 dot team name. OK, so in the select clause itself, notice that this whole case thing is part of the select. Right. Question. OK. OK, so uh, OK, the, the this notice that this case thing is coming after the comma here. Right, so you're listing the first team name, uh, second team name, and then you're listing either the first team name or the second team name as the winning team. OK, and whether you list the first team name or the second team name depends upon who scored more points. OK. So notice the use of the case in these kinds of situations. Okay, so this again is a, is an important illustrative example that you need to carefully look at. Okay, so any questions about this particular one because it's a little complicated.
Okay, so pay pay a lot of attention to this. I mean, if somebody had a question, I'd be able to explain. Uh, but just notice that this whole case thing is just appearing as part of the select, right? Because you see select something comma something comma and then the whole case. Okay, so the whole case to end. All of that is taking the place of one particular element in select, like a particular single column. That's all it is, right? Only thing it's doing is it's determining which column to display depending on the condition. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so this is again similar, just joining many times, that's all. Uh, there's one other point that I want to. Uh, so all this is illustrating is how to perform a join on two columns. Right? So here notice that when you're joining sections and registrations, okay, you're doing registrations, r dot course ID equals s dot course ID and r dot section name equals s dot section name. Okay, so that's an example of where you're joining two tables not on one column, but on two columns. Okay, that's what I had told you about earlier, that when you join sections and registrations, you have to join on both course ID and section. That's what's going on here. Okay. Okay, so this is important. This is the impo final important point that I want to clarify. It says for each course, list the course name and the number of sections offered. Right. So, for example, for one course, there may be three sections offered. Another course, there may be one section offered. But the important point it says is for courses with no sections. Show the number of sections as zero. OK. So the first attempt at this might look like, you know, you're joining courses with sections. Right. And because you want to show the number of courses as uh, sections as zero. For a course which is, you know, which has no sections, you want to give priority to courses. So obviously you're doing a left join, right? Because for courses which have no sections, you still want them to appear in the results, right? So we are doing a left join. Okay. So the results may look like this: courses C left join sections S on C dot course ID equals S dot course ID. Okay. So that's what you get. You've joined courses with sections. And you have done a left join, and therefore, notice that here is a course which has no sections. So, therefore, course ID, section name, and instructor ID are all null, meaning empty. Okay. Two courses, in fact, without any sections. Okay. So, now suppose we say select course name count star from courses C, left join, sections S, etc., etc. Group by course name. Okay. Now, what is the count you're going to get for course number 20? Right? When you do count star, what does it come? That's the important point here. Right? When you do count star, it simply counts the number of rows. Okay. And unfortunately, course number 20 has one row. OK, so it is going to show for course number 20 count of one and for course number 50, it is still going to show a count of one because count star counts the number of rows. OK, so this is not achieving what we want for courses with no sections show the number as zero. We are not achieving that. OK, so the result is still going to show for 20 and 50 a count of one, which is not correct. OK. So in order to solve the problem. OK, this is just explaining why that happened. OK, notice the code on the right hand side. It says instead of count star, we are saying count s dot course ID. OK, and when you count the values of a particular column, instead of just count star, OK, it is going to count only the number of non null values. That's the important point. OK, when you count an individual column, it is going to count how many non null values there are. 
when you just say count star it counts the number of rows okay so in this case you will see that the result is exactly what we want it shows zero for uh, for both uh, 20 and 50 or 30 and 50 whichever the courses that have no sections okay so this is again a very important point to uh, to understand right and that's what i'm pointing out here when you do count star it counts the number of rows when you do a particular column it counts the number of nominal values okay yeah so it's 8:30 and i think i have covered all the concepts i wanted to highlight okay uh, unfortunately because of the because of the format and because of the screen not showing up etc uh, you know i was probably not able to clarify some important aspects right but at the very least i think i have highlighted what are all the important things for the exam okay so you should definitely go back and i'll post these slides okay go take a look at them and of course if you have any questions don't hesitate to reach out thank you professor yep thank you this you can reach out to me on teams or send me an email whatever works for you i just have a quick question yeah uh so regarding the test next week what can we expect okay so the test will be uh in advance of the test i will give you the database okay so i'll give you the script you can load that into apex and you can look at all the tables and all the data and all that okay and then i'll simply have many sqls that you have to write exactly like what we are doing now right so i'll say you know uh, what what is the total number of suppliers right you know, how many suppliers are there in each city that kind of stuff and Got you it. write sql for that that's all so it's, it's not going to be anything too crazy right <laughs> cuz i mean it's like it'll be as crazy as what we've discussed today nothing gotcha. new. Okay, okay, perfect. All right. Yeah. Uh, are we taking it on? Is it multiple choice? Very straightforward. Yeah, go ahead. Is it multiple choice or is it going to be like the homeworks where we have to write out the SQL? Oh, you'll have to write the SQL, not multiple choice. You'll have to actually write the SQL. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And are there going to be any conceptual questions like based on no. the earlier no. parts of, or is it just going to be complete SQL? Only SQL, nothing else. Are we taking this on RP now, or is it just a Blackboard test? Uh, no, RP now. RP now. OK. I think uh, I, I, I have yeah. a question on RP now. Um, some, someone in another class was saying we had to like show our student ID or whatever at the beginning of it, but I never got one. I'm new, new to this and all. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I don't have mine either. Oh, you are. I use my license. Hmm. I think it's just any photo ID that says your name. OK, um, so we'll see. OK, uh, so yeah, if it's any photo ID, that's fine. OK, in the meanwhile, and for the part I'll, inquire, where I'll inquire with our TLTC people how this thing works, OK? Yeah, worst comes to worst, we, we'll work out something. Don't worry about it. Don't get too tense about it. We'll work it out. You should be able to find your student ID number in like your academic portal. Mm -hmm. No, you'll get the number, but if, if you have to actually show the ID, that's the question they have. If you have to physically show the ID to your camera. Okay. Oh yeah, I think you could just show your license. Yeah, license should work, I guess. Yeah. OK, we'll work it out. I'll, I'll reach out to TLTC and see what they say. OK. Thank you, Professor. Have a good night. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you, thanks Professor. For Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Professor. Thank, Thank you. you, Professor. Thanks, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Bye. Thanks, Professor. Thanks, Professor. Uh, Professor, can I talk to you about? Uh, many questions will be really easy. Yes, is it? Um, is it? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Sorry.
And also, we can use it. Like, in fact, I expect that we can use it. Oh, okay. So we can go on. I don't know. I don't know if it was a client who used it. No, no, no. I make sure that you have not been. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Also, do you know what this building is? This building? I have no idea. Do you have a class right here? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. 